I was uh, in Chelsea looking for a nightclub. I see a, a group of guys walking towards me. And I stopped him and I asked him, do you know where this nightclub is at? And he's just staring at me. He gives me this deep, awful gaze. So he's ready to walk away and he asks me, so you're a faggot? And I turn around. And God, I wish I didn't turn around. I've asked myself so many times, I just can't make sense of why someone would do that. An openly gay 15-year-old boy who was murdered. Investigating whether was a shooting that wounded three people inside a gay bar was a hate crime. A woman says that her attackers targeted her because she's a lesbian. Yelled anti-Hispanic and anti-gay slurs. The statistics are startling. There are about 12,000 hate-biased crimes based on sexual orientation alone over the last decade. In the last year that the FBI reported, which I believe was for 2007, there were over 7,600 um, uh, hate bias crimes in this country. In my research, and this is with non-criminal young adults, very high number, especially of the young men, admitted to some form of anti-gay behavior. About 18% of the men admitted to um, actual physical assaults. What we notice with hate crimes or hate violence incidents, there's this phenomena of overkill. Whereas someone, it may only take someone one or two stabbings to murder somebody, we've documented incidents of where someone may have been stabbed 30 or 40 times during the course of a, of a hate crime incident. People are beaten much more brutally, um, will be shot more times than someone who's just carrying out a crime that doesn't involve a hate element. So. Um, overkill is, is a very big part of, um, of this type of violence. The recent murder of Jorge Stephen, Stephen Lopez Mercado in Puerto Rico, a 19 year old, you know, he was brutally, brutally murdered, you know, dismembered, burned. Um, so those are the type of incidents that we see when, when there's a, a hate crime. Somebody yelled, tonight the faggots die and we just went for it. The best way to describe that evening was that it's sort of like taking a remote control and pressing fast forward. It's like really, really fast, adrenaline. Um, and a human being was left in a pool of blood in an alley in West Hollywood. One, two, three, four! The best way to describe myself is that I'm a former skinhead. Late 70s, early 80s, and there was a lot of violence that was involved. I was the person who initiated the majority of the confrontations because I knew that I had to prove myself. And at that time in, in Hollywood, there was a a rapidly growing gay community. And at times, uh, we clashed. This particular evening, we were already involved with violence that night. Um, we left the concert, and we were on our way to the hamburger stand. And we had probably stopped two or three times simply to get out of the car and beat somebody up. I mean, violence was in the air. It was like we were a pack of rabid wolves on the prowl looking for trouble. A typical hate crime offender against gay people specifically, and we can't generalize too much, but it tends to be young males, teenagers, and early 20s, and mo most often in a group. In my research, what I've come to think of it as, they're performing a spectacle for their friends, and they're trying to prove something to their friends, and that's why it's committed in a group. 
with the the victim really being a symbol which they can act against. And as his, his friends are all kicking me and punching me, they're also calling me a faggot. They're also calling me a sucker and just, and they're really getting a kick out of this. And I could see it in their faces. I could see that while he's, well, he's as serious as he can be and he's as enraged as he can be. The others are watching him do this to me. And they're smirking and they're laughing and they're kinking and they're, they're, uh, they're stomping and calling me names. There are a variety of motivations. Everybody is an individual, even when they're a member of a group. But typically, the group motivation has to do with proving masculinity. Masculinity for young men, it's not something that they are automatically born with or just automatically have happened to them. They have to establish it. This is the age group of, you know, teenagers, adolescents, young adults. They're, they're trying to cement their identity in the world, and as part of that, they want to be a proper man. And uh, if they don't show that in some way, there's a fear that they're not masculine. It's a very deep-seated fear, I think. Years ago, I would say, oh, no, I'm not. I'm a big macho skinhead, don't you know? I always thought that it was important for me to continue with that macho posturing or you know being the big tough guy i truly think one of the main reasons was is because i was a scared little boy even up until you know a, a few years ago a scared little boy when 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 i realized what had happened that night i started to piece everything together I was just, I was just further devastated. Everyone seems to focus on that one event, the attack, uh, the gay bashing itself. And no one seems to understand that it's, the situation is much bigger than just an attack or just someone being hurt, someone being called a name, someone getting beat up. We've come against this hate crimes bill, Lord. We've come against it. We've spoken to representatives of our government. Homosexual sodomy destroys people who practice it and nations that approve of it. Messages of, of hate, um, anti-gay messages, don't exist in a vacuum. You cannot continue to take moral wrongs and turn them into civil rights and survive as a people. What we know is that um, these anti-gay activists and many political leaders who, who speak out and, and rail against the LGBT community are sending a message that it's okay to hate. Someone might hold some very hateful beliefs, but we're America. Shouldn't they be allowed to hold those beliefs? And that message feeds down through the culture. It trickles down in the things that young people hear in the schoolyard and how they react and respond. It trickles down into the ways in which people can relate and, and be respected and valued in their communities. People who are perceived as LGBT are particularly vulnerable to violence because of the institutional or legalized discrimination that we have in this country against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. If you look at the Civil Rights Act generally, we're excluded from all of those protections. The don't ask, don't tell policies, the Defense of Marriage Act, all of those types of federal policies are laws that explicitly discriminate against us. Well, I think that sends the message that we are not equal in the eyes of the law, uh, which means we are less than or, or other in the eyes of our society. No matter how much the world is changing, I find at the heart of many conversations, people still think of us as deviant. We don't know where homos came from. We don't know where lesbians came from. 
We believe that homosexuality is destructive to society. It's nasty. It's disgusting. And so if I believe that a person who participates in a homosexual relationship, that that person is somehow anti-family or they're, you know, their, their very existence threatens the, the way of life for people who are heterosexual and people who consider themselves morally upright. If you believe that, then what conversation is there? There used to be this idea that young guys that attacked gays were afraid that they were gay and they were just sort of defensively responding because of their own mixed sexual feelings. And, you know, that could be true for some people. But in general, that is, has not been established by the research. And it, it looks more like young guys who do these group assaults in particular, they have this sense of cultural entitlement. I mean, I don't want no man blowing me a kiss either. I mean, things happen. I mean, I've been beat up like that too, but you know, you don't see me on the news and my family crying and this, this, and that. Wounds heal. Like they have the right, or they should, be helping to control social deviants by keeping people who violate gender norms in their place. Who has this biblical quote tattooed on his shoulder. Leviticus 18.22, you should not lay with another man as one does with a woman, for it is an abomination. I was led to believe that in order for me to save the country, I had to go out and I had to do what the authorities were, were afraid to do. You know, I had never had any sort of experience or relationship with somebody from, that was positive from the gay community. It's our culture that tells young people that they can go out and beat people up for whatever reason. It's, it's really just a matter of degree. If everybody's saying, hey, faggot this, and even bitch that about women or girls, it's just a matter of degree before those attitudes can translate into something more physical. We cannot survive if we sodomize our sons and our daughters. We see the statistics of people being beat up and oftentimes killed because of who they are. And so we know, we know the effects that this language has. And, and when we live in a society of free speech, and I will defend those folks' rights to the day I die to say what they want to say, but I will not defend their rights um, to promote violence and to say that it's OK to kill and beat up gay people. After more than a decade of opposition and delay, we've passed inclusive hate crimes legislation to help protect our citizens from violence based on what they look like, who they love, how they pray, or who they are. It is often thought that hate crimes legislation is our issue. And so once hate crimes legislation was passed, our issue is done, like, and successfully done, and congratulations. And there is legitimacy to what hate crimes legislation can do for our communities, but that is not only not the sum total of what we're trying to do in moving policy, but it's actually not even the most important part of what we're trying to do in move policy, because it is so punitive and it is so reactive. Like, what we want to see is a shift in attitude, a shift in culture. When the message out there is so horrible that to be gay, you can get killed for it, we need to change the message. Hate is like a disease, like a cancer. And I think until we as a society go after the causes, not what happens afterwards, not the effects of hate, but the cause of the hate. Because you can, you, can, you can cut out something and it can still be there. Um, you have to find the cause, cure the cause, and you'll cure the hate.